Paul uh, was the co-developer of the rotavirus vaccine, which now all children take. Rotavirus uh, causes gastroenteritis, responsible for a huge number of deaths worldwide among children in gastroenteritis. And Paul has had a hu huge impact. Uh, he and his colleagues, uh, Fred Clark and, um, and Dr. Plotkin, on, um, on really uh, saving many, many lives uh, with regard to his vaccine. So not only are you going to hear an entertaining speaker tonight, but I just want you to know that his effect on world health is, has really been profound, too. So I'm really pleased to welcome my friend and colleague, uh, Paul Offit. Paul? Thanks, Russ. That was very kind. Um, when, when I started to write, working on this book, the, the original title was Quacks, How They Hurt Us and Why We Let Them. Um, and as I wrote it, I actually came around a little bit. And so there now is a word in the subtitle, Sense, because I think there is some sense to this. And I, I so bear with me as I go through this and sort of tell you about sort of my quest and all this. And it's, it's, I'll start with a story. The, 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 um, there is a guy who is a, a professor of law at, at the University of Pennsylvania, he's a good friend, and he swears by acupuncture. He, he, he had low back pain, um, he tried non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs without effect, he tried COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex without effect, and when he had acupuncture, he said it turned him around, it changed his life. For the first time, his pain was gone. And so, so we'll start with acupuncture. What, what, what was going on with this guy, who, who we'll call Eric, because that's his name. <laughs> um, so this, this is a, a picture of uh, early acupuncture. It actually, <laughs> actually wasn't that early. Um, it, it actually was born in, um, in ancient China, specifically in the second century BC. Now, now the ancient Chinese did, did not believe in dissection. In fact, not only did they not believe in it, but anybody who was caught dissecting a human body was punished by death. So it was a real disincentive to do any sort of anatomy. <laughs> and, and they believed in a number of things. They believed that there were, the body consisted of 365 distinct parts because there were 365 days of the year. They believed that the key to good health was bounce, based on bouncing yin and yang, which would allow this vital energy, which they called qi, to flow. And the way in which one did that balancing was by inserting thin needles under the skin for, for various periods of time and at, at lengths anywhere from a half an inch to four inches under the skin. Now, the, 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 when they decided how to, um, to do that, they, they came up with these meridians, which are just these longitudinal arcs that range from head to toe. And the number of meridians that they chose were 12, because there are 12 great rivers in China. So if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you believe that the, the human, uh, ana human anatomy is not based on days of the year and it's not based on rivers in China, then they were making it up that there's nothing in theory that's accurate about acupuncture. Those are just pictures of meridians, and, and it's, it's true. I mean, if you, there are a series of, of wonderful studies here. If you take people like my friend Eric who benefit from acupuncture and you cert, insert the needles at, according to these, these predefined uh, ancient Chinese points, uh, points, or you just insert them randomly, people still benefit. So it doesn't really matter where you insert the needle. And then more recently, in the last few years, there's a researcher at the University of Exeter in England named Edzard Ernst, who came up with a brilliant idea, which was to, to use something called retractable needles. So you feel the pinch of the needle, but you don't know actually whether it's gone under your skin. And even those people benefit. So it doesn't matter where you insert the needle. It doesn't matter whether you insert the needle. Those who benefit still benefit. So the question is why? And I think the answer has to do with what is unfortunately named the placebo response. And, and because I think when people hear the word placebo derived from the Latin, I will please, they think it's all just in my head, that it's not real, that, that I'm not really experiencing less pain, I just am experiencing the same pain, but I just think it's less. And that's not true. And, and I'll tell you, tell you why, because there were, um, in the early 1970s, two men who discovered these chemicals that are released by our own pituitary, by our own hypothalamus called endorphins, um, which is just a, a contraction of en endo, endogenous, meaning made in the body, orphine is, is just from, from morphine. So you make your own sort of opiate agonists. You make your own morphine-like drugs. And when they took people like my friend Eric and gave them an endorphin blocker like naloxone or just gave them saline, those who were given the, 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 the naloxone experienced 
experienced uh, the pain again. So there is at least a subset of people who, when they get acupuncture, have learned to release their own endorphins. And that's cool. I mean, I think that's really interesting. And I think that, that people that do things like acupuncture, I think, owe it, frankly, to the medical community to, when something works, figure out why it works. What is it about that interaction that's working? The second um, um, story is a friend of mine in California. So, so it's California, so maybe it doesn't count, but, but still, <laughs> we're, we're going we're to include her. Um, again, a, a very smart woman. She started a, a, uh, a company called Upstart, which was a high-tech marketing firm, which, which she ultimately sold out for $17 million. I mean, she's not a stupid person. And she, she, um, she believed that when she took a homeopathic remedy called oscillococcinum, and I'll go through what that is in a second, that her colds got better faster. She was convinced that, that this was a miracle, a, homeo a homeopathic drug. So let's go through homeopathy so you can understand where it comes from. So homeopathy was founded by this man, uh, Samuel Hahnemann, in 1790. And, and the, the way, the, where, where the word comes from, it was an experience that he had. He was chewing on um, chinchona bark, which contains quinine, which is a known treatment for malaria. And when he did that, he developed a fever, which is interesting because quinine actually doesn't cause fever, but it caused, he at least had a fever associated with, taking, with uh, chewing on that chinchona bark. And he, he made sort of the following association, okay, I'm, I'm taking quinine, which induces fever and, and treats malaria, and malaria causes fever. So, so therefore, he came up with the notion of like cures like. Therefore, if you're going to, and that's where the word comes from. I mean, homeopathy literally means similar suffering. So if you're going to treat vomiting, then what you do is you give an emetic, something that causes vomiting. Or if you want to treat diarrhea, then you give a purgative, which causes diarrhea. Now, now there was one catch to that, was that he wanted to take that preparation and dilute it to the point that, as we now know, it wasn't there anymore. In other words, there's, there's no active ingredient left. And, and um, he called that the law of infinitesimals. Now, he, in, in, to his credit, or not his credit, in his defense, um, this was this, the 1790s. Now, Avogadro didn't come up with his number until, until uh, 1811. So it was about 20 years before that. So Avogadro's number was, we know that a mole of a substance contains 10 to the 23rd molecules. So now we know the number, where if you dilute it to a certain point, there won't be anything there anymore. He didn't know that to his, in his defense, but that number has stood the test of time for the last two centuries, and homeopaths certainly know that today. But still, um, they believe that when um, these drugs are diluted, that the water remembers where it's been, so-called molecular memory. Um, you don't want water to remember where it's been. There's, there's a limited <laughs> amount of water on the face of the earth. Um, think where water's been. So, so let's talk about this, this drug that my uh, friend Patty used. It's called Oslococcin. It's made by a company in France called Boiron. And it's listed here, and it's interesting because, for, for, uh, as I'll get to a little bit, with dietary supplements, you really can't make a specific medical claim. But you can actually, for in some, to some extent, with homeopathic drugs, which have been basically not regulated by the FDA since the late 1920s. So it says that it, it's the nature's number one. It's nature's number one flu medicine. It's, it treats symptoms of the flu, including fever, chills, body aches, and pains. Okay, so here's how you make oslococcin. You take a Burberry duck, you sacrifice it. You then take out its liver and heart. You homogenize that. You dilute it one to a hundred in water. Okay. Then you do another serial 100-fold dilution 200 more times. So this preparation is 10 to the minus 400, which means that the duck is gone. There, there is not a single molecule of that duck left. In fact, if you had diluted it into the final, if your final volume were the volume of the universe, which is roughly three times 10 to the 80th cubic meters, um, you would have trouble finding a molecule of it there. So it's, um, it's what it was diluted in. So if you look at the, the box, um, it's, 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 it's diluted. It, the final preparation actually is one gram of sugar, and that's what it is. It's one gram of sugar. Okay. Now, homeopathy, because it's, it's some level so silly, that it's, it's very easy to make fun of. And there's a group in Canada called the uh, Center for Inquiry who have a series of things like this. This is an example of homeopathic <laughs> contraception. There's still nothing in it. Um, but, but, but 
to, to take up my friend Patty's point of view, what's going on? I mean, is it possible that when she takes this remedy that she thinks is going to make her better, that it makes her better? And belief is everything. I mean, belief that, that, that you are going to get better means a lot. When you come into our hospital, um, you believe you're going to get better. I think some people believe they're going to get better. And that, that matters. And you know, we practice sort of all manner of deception, you could argue. We have white coats, we have red stenciling, we have nice offices, um, we have machines that are big and make interesting noises. I mean, it's sort of all part of the therapeutic scheme in some ways. Um, and my daughter actually is a perfect example. My daughter, who is a graduating senior, will be coming to the University of Pennsylvania next year. She had a, um, a uh, when she wrote Crew for Agnes Irwin, she would get tingling in her, in her fingers sometimes. And she decided that she had exercise-induced asthma, which she doesn't have. So she wanted a bronchodilator, which she wasn't going to get. So, so instead what she did is she, we, my wife took her to the General Nutrition Center where she bought something called, um, it was Himalayan sea salt puffer. And what that is, is it's, it's presumably salt obtained from the Himalayan formations. It's put into a plastic canister on the top of which are these holes and you breathe in basically the salt there. So she's sitting there at the, at, the, uh, at the breakfast table reading with fascination the side of this box. I mean, Himalayan formations that's hundreds of millions of years old, this is going to be great. And I said to her, honey, I mean, do you really think that the sodium chloride in this is any different than the sodium chloride in that salt shaker? And she looked at me and said, would you let me believe in something, damn it? <laughs> that's right. But, but there are some interesting studies that sort of, again, sort of uh, uh, go under the category of, of what could be happening in the world of placebo medicine. And this, to me, is actually the most fascinating. I don't know if you remember this study from the mid-70s. It was done by uh, Robert Ader and, and Nicholas Cohn. And it was done in, in rats. And what they did was they took a group of rats and injected them with sheep red blood cells. It's a, so it's a foreign protein, uh, proteins. And they developed, not surprisingly, an immune response to those sheep red blood cells. Then they took a second group and injected them with the same red blood cells, except this time they also gave them saccharin flavored water, which obviously had no effect on the immune system and the rats still developed an immune response to the sheep red blood cells. Now what they did with the third group was they injected them with red blood cells that was in saccharin flavored water that was added, into which was added cyclophosphamide, which is an immune suppressive drug. And when they did that, the animals didn't make an immune response. But then, you know, the cyclophosphamide would, would wear off and the immune response would, would uh, they would be able to make an immune response. And so, so what, what happened was is they they, um, they, they would give them the, the saccharin flavored water with cyclophosphamide and they wouldn't develop an immune response. Give them the saccharin flavored immune, uh, 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 water with cyclophosphamide and they wouldn't develop an immune response. I did this a few times. And then what they did was they gave these animals sheep, after their immune response had recovered, they gave them sheep red blood cells with just saccharin flavored water, something that shouldn't have in any way suppressed their immune system, yet they didn't make an immune response, which is to say these rats had learned to suppress their own immune system. That's amazing. And there are actually many studies, there's like five books on, on placebo medicine, where you can teach people to upregulate their immune system by releasing certain cytokines and chemokines or downregulate their immune system. You can pair si smells and tastes with, say, a drug uh, like a steroid in, in, in lupus patients and teach patients actually to release their own steroids that can be immune suppressed. So, I mean, it's really sort of an interesting field. Um, so, so one wonders when you're taking oscillococcin, and she believes this is making her better, um, that it may, in some many ways it may be making her better. It's possible. It's certainly studyable. Not that the company Boiron has ever studied this, but um, <laughs> It is. And there's, there's other things. There's uh, John Imboden um, in 1957 uh, led a group of Hop Hopkin re Hopkins researchers who performed psychological tests on military recruits just prior to what was a massive influenza pandemic in 1957. So, and what they found were that the recruit, recruits who were depressed had symptoms that were more severe, longer lasting, and shed virus for longer than those who weren't depressed. Or said another way, mood determined illness. Your mood can determine your illness and arguably because it's affecting your immune response. And as I said before, one can learn to, to do these things. Um, and so the, the line from John Milton out of Paradise Lost that I like is the mind can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. I think that's true. And when alternative therapists will say that, um, you know, that, that it's the mind-body connection, that's, I think that's real. And, and I, I do think, again, it would be interesting to study these things rather than to to point to the gods, which is usually what happens. I mean, Mehmet Oz, for example, who is, is discussed in this book, um, not terribly favorably, but, but he, um, 
he he will 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 say you know there's just some things science can't know. I mean why why these ancient Chinese things worked we just can't and then that's wrong. I mean if if it's a scientific issue or a medical issue you can know it, and uh, we don't have to look to the gods to explain why these things work. The phospholipoxin really does work in my friend Patty. Um, you can study whether or not she is being conditioned to upregulate her immune system in an effective way. You can do that. It's, that's not done, but one could do that. <coughs> Okay, so, so when do you cross the line? When does alternative medicine become quackery? And that's, I'm just going to spend the rest of the time on this to talk about <coughs> that. So the first is, I think, that, that when, doesn't appreciate, when one doesn't appreciate certain harms that are caused by alternative medicine, and, and you can use the acupuncture example. I mean, acupuncture needles have lodged in hearts, lungs, and livers. They've introduced viral infections such as hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and human immunodeficiency virus. At least 86 people have died from acupuncture. So you could actually make an argument for using retractable needles. You know, it, if retractable needles work, then use them. And I've talked to some acupuncturists about this, and they say, you know, but that would be deceptive. But see, you're already knee deep in the deceptive that putting the needles under the skin have anything to do with like affecting, you know, this this unblocking, you know, this static that's occurring in the nervous system. Um, so, so I think uh, that's just something to consider. And certainly, there are, I'll get to dietary supplements in a minute. But uh, dietary supplements are largely an unregulated industry, and so there are certainly harms caused by some of these substances that, that people just don't know. The second, I think, is, the, is when one chooses a, an alternative therapy instead of a conventional therapy that works. And the poster boy for this is Steve Jobs. S Steve Jobs had a pancreatic cancer. And, and when people hear the word pancreatic cancer, they assume, reasonably, that that's a death sentence. I mean, the medicine has not caught up to treating this disease. And for 97% of pancreatic cancers, that's true. It's the so-called adenocarcinomas. But that's not what he had. He had a neuroendocrine tumor that just happened to be in his, can in his pancreas. Had he had early surgery, the, the, at least historically, the, the treatment with early surgery results in somewhere between a 95 to 100 percent chance of survival. Um, but he chose not to do that. Instead, what he did was he did uh, acupuncture, he did bowel cleansings, he did sort of large quantities of fruit and vegetable juices, and by the time he had his surgery, which was almost a year later, it was too late. Another example, and there's a few examples of this, is if you go into your, into your, uh, your health food store, if you will, or into any drug store or GNC center, there is the wink and nod of the dietary supplement industry. And, and um, basically since 1994, with the, um, with the passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, um, an act that has nothing to do with education and everything to do with the consumer not knowing what they're bu buying. A an, a an act that when it was passed was called by the New York Times the Snake Oil Protection Act. <laughs> um, you have these companies who basically are under no obligation to support their claims or admit their harms. And so you have a drug like, you have something like this, garlicin, garlicin, garlic, these are concentrated garlic preparations. And the wink and nod of this industry is you can't make a specific healthcare claim. You can't say that gar concentrated garlic lowers bad cholesterol. You can't say that, um, the so-called low density lipoprotein cholesterol. But that's the understanding. If, if you go into a health food store and say, you know, I'm looking for natural ways to lower my cholesterol, this is what you'll be pointed to. Now there's been a study done, this is an easy study to do, right? The, the, uh, the final, uh, the readout is just a, a, a blood test, so it's, it's not subjective at all. Um, this study has been done redundantly, one of which is shown here that was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine. Garlic does not lower bad cholesterol. So if you are a person who has high levels of LDL cholesterol and you have a risk of, of cardiovascular disease or you've had a cardiovascular event and you choose this instead of a stat, you know, like Lipitor sort of being an example, you are making a bad choice. Yet, the, the, you would not know that. I mean, you would not know that from reading the label. The other example is a Saul Palmetto. So, so if you go to your health food store and you're, you have benign prostatic hypertrophy, I, although I don't know why the person who invented the name for this ever used the word benign, there's nothing benign about prostatic hypertrophy. When your prostate is large, enlarges as you get older, it blocks urinary flow. It can cause increase your risk for kidney stones, bladder disease, kidney disease. It's a tough, 
disorder. Um, and so some will recommend salt palmetto. And, that's, and the wink and nod is always this, right? For prostate health, for joint health, for cardiovascular, for heart health. Um, but again, there are medicines like Flomax Ravidart, which can actually either shrink your prostate or relax muscles of the prostate so that, that you can get relief. And so if you're taking this, again, you're making a bad choice. My personal favorite, and you may appreciate this, Mark, is this is not a big problem in the United States at the moment, but it is a big problem in Canada and in Europe, the so-called homeopathic vaccines, which is, in the case that you look on the left, it says an HPV vaccine. These are called nosodes, which is you take, for example, fluid from a, a, a woman who has uh, an HPV infection, you then dilute it to the point that it's not there anymore, and you then call that a vaccine. That's dangerous. Because HPV vaccine, the real one, works. So if you're choosing this, you're making a terrible choice. The third way I think in which alternative medicine crosses the line, and probably the most egregious, is um, draining people's bank accounts. There are plenty of people out there, charlatans, quacks, who are perfectly willing to make a fortune off of your misfortune. And, and where they tend to show up is in areas where medicine hasn't fails. So for example, um, autism is a disorder um, which does not have a clear cause or causes and as a consequence doesn't have a clear cure or cures. And so there are many people who offer cures for autism. Similarly, there are certain cancers, brainstem gliomas being one example, um, uh, glioblastoma multiforme being another, which uh, are not terribly amenable to current therapies. And so we have you know, the cancer cures. It's interesting if you go through this, and I go through this at some length in the book, if you look at the, the cures here, it's really the same for both groups. Whether you have cancer or autism, you know, it's, they're all treated with you know, megavitamins, dietary supplements, bowel cleansing, fruit and vegetable juices, sweat lodges, hyperbaric oxygen chambers, chelation, res restricted diets, chiropractic manipulations, homeopathic remedies, electrical or magnetic stimulation, probiotics, intravenous immunoglobulins, and cell stem cell transplant among others. I think the, the key here, by the way, is, is that if you ever walk into a, a clinician's office and they recommend something that they're also selling out of their office, that's a clue, okay? The, the other clue is when the clinician says, this is, you know, I'm going to give you something that your doctor doesn't want you to know about. If it works, your doctor would want you to know about it. Or that the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know about it. That sort of appeal to conspiracy theory. Also, if you have to go to Tijuana to get it, that's also <laughs> a bad sign. <clears throat> And lastly, and then I'll, I'll stop here, it gives plenty of time for questions, I think is, is the notion that we're, you know, we promote magical thinking. I think I, Mehmet Oz does this. I mean, if you watch his show, um, a show that reaches four million people a day, um, he will have faith healers on his show. And, you know, that's, that's danger. I, I don't know if any of you uh, followed the story in Philadelphia of, uh, of Brandon and Kent Scheibel, two uh, little boys, both of whom died from bacterial pneumonia, both of whose parents were members of a faith tabernacle church that believed in prayer and not med modern medicine, both of whom prayed when their children had bacterial pneumonia, and both of those children died needlessly of a treatable disease because they believed that God would save them uh, and that God was, was uh, w that one did not need man if you had God. And so um, when, he, when he brings faith healers on his show, and he did, he brought a, he brought a, a guy named Isaac, uh, uh, Isim uh, Nima, and he, he showed, he brought a woman who had a, um, a, a quote-unquote mass. He always described it as a mass. He never said cancer, but, but that's what one presumed when you hear the word mass. If you looked at that CT scan, if you sort of watch the show again and freeze frame that CT scan, what you see is you see a small mass with very irregular margins. That's not typical of cancer, which usually has smooth margins. This was probably a small bacterial pneumonia. It was never biopsy, or at least there was never a mention made of biopsy. And then through the working with this faith healer, she suddenly could take a breath and she got better and, and probably because she had a small bacterial pneumonia which got better on its own. So he misled his audience and I think that's, that's just dangerous. And he sort of, but he appeals to the magic. I mean, he has people who can communicate on the dead on his show. He has a guy named John Edward, not Edwards, but Edward on his show who communicates with the dead. Um, and he will, have, um, he will have people on the show who get, for example, large quantities of intravenous vitamins, so-called megavitamins. That's dangerous. I mean, if you look, I don't know if you've been following the story, but, but if you look at the data, if you take, and, and I'm not talking about multivitamins. Multivitamins usually contain at or about the recommended daily amounts. Most people probably don't need them. If you have a reasonable diet, you probably don't need it. It probably just makes for a lot of expensive urine, but we feel compelled <laughs> to do it as kind of insurance policy. Um, 
Um, I'm talking about megavitamins. I'm talking about when you take five-fold, ten-fold, twenty times more than the recommended daily amounts, which we do without thinking. I mean, for those who pop a thousand milligrams of vitamin C into their mouth without thinking about it, that's eight times the recommended daily allowance. I mean, you would have to, to eat eight cantaloupes to, or 14 oranges to get that quantity, and you know, our stomach is only so big for a reason. We're not supposed to eat that much. There's actually a commercial on television where they have uh, a woman ingesting just a small pill and to the uh, vitamin C, and she says, you know, you would have to drink two gallons of orange juice to get what's in this. Maybe you're not supposed to drink two gallons of orange juice. <laughs> So in any case, the, this from Robert Slack at the Center for Inquiry, the gaps in medical knowledge we all dread are not likely to be filled by energy fields, meridians, and astrology, but by the pursuit of knowledge under a single set of standards we call, call science. The way forward is through a careful and purposeful pursuit of scientific truth, even if it means leaving some of our most romantic notions of, or romantic fallacies behind. And I think that's part of the appeal of alternative medicine. I, when you look at people like Andrew Weil or Deepak Chopra or, or Mehmet Oz, they, they sort of imbue their medicine with, with a spirituality that borders on mysticism. That's not something we do at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We're, we're seen, I think, as, as sort of more scientific, drier, technological, and, uh, and you lose that sort of, that deeper meaning, if you will. But, uh, you know, therein danger can lie. The, the other thing that bothers me about them is that they sort of, they, they sort of have this guru model. In other words, it, it's, you should believe me it, it, because I say it. And, and, and if, I, if you read Andrew Weil's books or even Deepak Chopra's, um, they're often these sort of ex cathedra statements that aren't based on anything. You know, there's, there's a book, there, one, one statement is, you know, that you should not buy a fruit bowl because that would mean that, you were, that fruit would be sitting in a bowl for a period of time. You should always use fruit fresh. Huh? But where does that come from? I, they just sort of say it. And it's, it, there was this article by Michael Spector in the New Yorker about Mehmet Oz, and it talked about how when he would come into the studio, just flocks of people would come to be around him, just to be near him, just to touch the hem of his coat, to sort of <laughs> stick to the New Testament analogies. But, um, you know, that, that's dangerous. It's never, it should never be about the man. It should always be about the data. Where are the data? That's, that's what matters. So um, I'll close with this line regarding promoting magical thinking from Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which tells you how old I am. Is, isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it, too? All right, so I'll, I'll stop there. It gives us a solid 20 minutes for your questions. Thanks.